Thank you. So, this is DNA. We've known about this structure for over 60 years now, but it's only recently that we've started to realize how important this thing could be technologically. It's starting to look like DNA could be a key ingredient for solving some of our biggest challenges. And today, I want to walk you through the line of thinking that leads to that idea. In order to understand why DNA is so important as a foundation for new technologies, it's helpful to look back at a technological transition from the last century in electronics. It used to be that we had a bunch of special purpose machines for different tasks, telegraphs for communicating your voice, typewriters for text, film reels for video. But today, of course, with the iPhone, a single physical device can do all of those functions and more. And this might seem like a trivial or superficial observation, but I think it actually really gets to the essence of information technology, which is that it's about universal codes. So in a computer, the universal code is called binary code. It's long strings of zeros and ones. And it's an amazing fact that as far as your computer is concerned, there's no real difference between doing something like a, making a video phone call on Skype or writing the text for this talk on uh, Microsoft Word or even making a drawing in a drawing program. As far as the computer is concerned, all of these things just come down to tiny differences in the exact pattern, exact sequence of binary code that's stored in the computer's hard drive. And this discovery of universal codes and of universal machines for reading those codes in electronics has been one of the most important discoveries in the history of our species. And right now, we're in the midst of a similar type of transition in how we deal with biology, which gets us back to DNA. So DNA is fundamentally a molecule whose purpose is to store information. It's just four chemical letters, A, T, G, and C arranged in long chains to form words. Long before computers existed, long before human beings existed, DNA was the first information technology that the universe invented. It's more than just the basis of genetics and heredity. It's a universal medium for storing information, like a USB stick. Now, what I want to do today is to ask you to take that analogy seriously, to think of DNA as an information technology and to ask what the implications of that point of view might be. And for a start, one thing we know is that an information technology that's based on biological molecules is going to look very different from the silicon-based information technology that we have today in our computers. And to see why, all we have to do is look at how the physical process inside a cell is different from the type of physical process that goes on in our computers. So this is a single-celled microorganism. And for a sense of scale, that white bar up there, uh, from end to end, is uh, one one-hundredth the width of a human hair. It's smaller than the smallest thing that we can see without a microscope. And inside this cell, there are intricate molecular machines of a complexity that is still unrivaled by human engineering. And that's because evolution has had a billion-year head start, literally, in engineering at the molecular scale. We're just beginning to understand the principles that underlie this system. If you zoom in further into just a random patch of the cell, what you see is a crowded, jumbled mess. Every molecule is bumping into every other molecule. It's amazing that the cell can produce machines at all under this type of condition. Think about it. It's as if you took a heap of Legos and you threw them into the washing machine, and after all the shaking and stirring, a perfectly formed object emerged spontaneously. But that's what happens. And it's completely different from the way we make things in the everyday world, in the macroscopic world. In, in our everyday life, if we want to build something, what we do is we pick up each piece and we assemble it one by one using an arm or using a crane or some other tool that has a well-defined path traveling through space. But in the cell, in the molecular world, there really is no such machine as a crane because all the molecules are just bumping around randomly into each other like I was showing you. And so if you want to build something, you have to program the individual pieces to find each other and assemble themselves into a shape all by themselves. And 
Today, we're starting to be able to do the same thing in our own technology. We can think of DNA as a kind of molecular Lego brick for assembling structures and devices that can take action inside our bodies. And the reason that this works is because each DNA sequence is like a unique Lego brick. It has only one exactly matching partner sequence, one soulmate within the whole world of possible DNA sequences that it will stick to. And amazingly, over the past few years, scientists have developed the ability to synthesize completely new synthetic DNA molecules in the lab without any biological organism involved, just like any other chemical. So we can make any DNA sequence we want. We can even buy DNA sequences custom made off the internet. And the ability to do this is causing us to rethink basic principles of engineering because we can try to recapitulate the biological process of self-assembly in our own hands. This is a video made by my friend Sean Douglas which shows how this process works. You throw all the strands together, all these pieces of DNA, into a test tube and they find each other and they assemble into a shape of your own design, into any shape you want, in this case into a rectangle. Zooming into the structure, we can see how instead of two strands making a double helix, we actually have many strands interacting with each other and forming a shape, which is composed of many double helices that are intertwined with each other into a kind of a weave or basket. DNA self-assembly has the potential, although it's still at an early stage, to reduce nanotechnology, the problem of building tiny machines largely to a programming problem, which is the problem of choosing the right DNA letters. And we even have a computer-aided design software called CAD Nano, where the user can draw a shape, and the CAD Nano will spit out the sequences that you need in order to assemble that shape. And this synergy between DNA and computers is now so streamlined that 18-year-olds can quickly learn how to use it and make new objects. So this is a picture of a DNA box, which was designed by a group of college freshmen over a summer. And the idea here is to use molecular containers, refined from this rudimentary one, as a way to deliver drugs to the right locations inside the body. Ultimately, what we want to do, and people are already working on this, is to give these systems the ability to sense and respond to their environments and essentially become microscopic robots or computers in their own right. In the long term, the ability to program new information into biological molecules could have revolutionary consequences, particularly given that we are not only able these days to write new information into DNA sequences, but also to read the information back out again, so converting DNA letters back into zeros and ones. And this technology of DNA sequencing is advancing even faster than the astounding rate at which computers have been getting better over the last few decades. So it's interesting to speculate about what might become possible as this goes on. As one example, instead of thinking of DNA like a Lego brick for building structures as we've been doing, we can think of it as a barcode, or more fashionably these days, as a QR code. Fundamentally, a barcode is just an arbitrary string of information that you can attach to some object, and then later on, you can read the information again, and you can learn something about the object, like what its identity was. So a DNA barcode is just a unique string of DNA that we can identify, it's just any sequence of DNA. Now let's consider how this idea might apply to cancer. Cancer is an uncontrolled growth of cells. Normally your cells stay put, they stay in place. But in cancer, they grow and divide uncontrollably and overrun their boundaries. We know that cancer begins with a single cell that goes haywire and starts to divide and make copies of itself uncontrollably. And this is a huge problem because unlike an infectious disease, if you want to fight cancer, that involves fighting your own cells. But let's imagine that sometime in the future, we could endow each cell in the body with a unique DNA barcode sequence, with a unique string of DNA that identifies that particular cell. Now let's suppose that one cell goes haywire and you get cancer. We can take a sample of the tumor and we can read the, C the DNA, we can read the sequence of that barcode to identify the unique cell that gave rise to this tumor. 
And we then have access to a DNA barcode sequence which corresponds exactly to those cells which are the cancer and not to any of the other cells that are healthy in your body. So then the problem of killing the cancer, if we had DNA barcodes, would become equivalent to killing exactly those cells which have a particular DNA barcode. And although this is still a very challenging problem, it might not be an intractable one. The point here is that the way we think about fighting disease changes fundamentally when we have the ability to manipulate the information content of biological molecules very precisely. In other areas like brain science, the same idea of DNA barcodes and DNA sequencing may be applicable. So in the brain, the cells are packed in very densely uh, in a small space, and it makes it hard to see in a microscope which cell is which and how they're connected to each other. But it's very important that we be able to do that because without knowing how the cells are wired up, there's no way that we can understand how brain circuits actually function and work together to generate our consciousness or how the wiring goes wrong in a disease like schizophrenia. But here, DNA barcodes have already become useful because using fluorescent proteins, we can take a DNA barcode and convert it into a color code. So if each cell has a unique DNA barcode sequence, it also has a unique color and we can see how it's different from all the other cells. The inventors of this technology called it a brainbow. It's important to realize that these stories and ideas are just a handful of emerging possibilities that are based on understanding and harnessing the information-driven processes that underlie living things. So the question that I want to leave you with is this one. If you could write any sequence into DNA, if you could write any message into DNA, what would you write? Because although evolution has had a billion year head start in writing these DNA essays, I think that we're going to come out on top in the end. Thank you.